Hey everyone, my name is Tim, and I would like to share with you an interesting music theory experience I just had. So it started when I was, just the other day, watching a video by one of my favorite YouTubers, 12 Tone. And in this video, which I'll link below, he found a scale, one of thousands of possible scales, that didn't have a name and then composed a piece of music in that weird scale. And so uh, this actually kind of inspired me because I had developed a model, mathematical model of chord consonants or dissonance. And I thought, you know, maybe I could use that to discover which scale would be the worst sounding one. So I posted this comment and, uh, and I got a response which from somebody saying that he'd like to see a video on it. So I thought, well, okay, what the heck? I can do that. Um, maybe. So let's go over what I did. So I'm going to share with you what I did to identify what this worst possible scale might be. Now there's some assumptions here. For instance, I'm using our usual 12 tone system in Western music and I'm also only considering heptatonic scales, those that have seven notes within an octave like what we're used to. So given those assumptions, what I did was I first I scoured the internet for lists of chords, chords that people play on instruments. In this case, I only used the three note and four note chords, so the triads and tetrads. I actually made a model that considers chords with more notes in them, but for the purposes of this, um, I'm only using the model that considers those types of chords. So now, given those lists of chords, what I did was I assumed that any chord I didn't find, any possible triad or tetrad that was not in any list that I could find, and anything that just seemed too unreasonable, was too dissonant to be a chord, to be a real chord. So I, so my machine learning model that I'm going to show you is based on assuming that all of those non-listed chords are probably bad and shouldn't be played. Then what I did was, using the machine learning method I'm going to describe, I came up with a mathematical description of a chord, so a way to turn a chord into numbers, and then I applied linear regression to generate a mathematical model. So first, I thought it probably would be a good idea to define what dissonance and consonance are. So here we have a virtual keyboard, piano keyboard, and I'm going to show you some examples of dissonant and consonant chords. So uh, perhaps one of the most dissonant ones is the minor second. Which sounds pretty bad. Um, a little bit less dissonant than that would be the major second. And then we start getting into more consonant chords. Minor third, major third, fourth. Okay. But then there's a dissonant one that comes up next. That's, we call this the tritone because it's three whole steps from the root. Uh, then the fifth. And then some slightly less consonant, but pretty consonant chords like the minor six, major six, the minor seven, which is kind of dissonant. And then uh, more dissonant than that uh, would be the major seventh. Now let's talk about how I turned these chords into numbers so that I could generate a mathematical model of how consonant or dissonant they would be expected to sound. So the first chord that we have listed here, C, E, and G to played together, would be a C major chord, and in the intervals. So I'm counting, I count a, ma a minor third between E and G, a major third between C and E, and a fifth between C and G. So I'm going to put one in a vector for each of those. And since this is a consonant chord, it's a nice sounding one, I want a mathematical formula to give me a positive number as an output. So I want to be able to take each of these columns and multiply them by a coefficient. And when I add them up, I want to get a positive number. The next example is C, C sharp, and D. It's a really horrible sounding chord. I can't even play it on the virtual piano. For some reason, it won't let me do it. And it has two minor seconds and a major second. And believe me, it sounds really bad. 
And so this is a chord that we would want the model to compute a negative number. And so what I did was I went through each of the chords and based on whether or not I found them online and generally how good or bad they seem to sound with different degrees of certainty, labeled every possible triad and tetrad that I could find as positive or negative. So let's have a quick look at some of the training data. Okay, so here we've got my training data and some of the output. This isn't actually the input that I gave to the program exactly, uh, but this is what I turned chords into. So these are the input vectors that I, uh, that I just described a moment ago. And so the first set that we have are the basic intervals. So we have minor second, major second, all the way up to major seven. And based on generally agreed perceptions of these intervals, I labeled them confidently negative and positive. Okay, so the ma uh, major and minor seconds are very dissonant. The major and minor thirds are consonant and so on. Now, one of the questions that's going to arise and will be answered by the model is how relatively consonant and dissonant are they? And when we see the coefficients, you'll see how that came out. So now, when we deal with chords, such as this one, okay, now I wasn't entirely sure that it was going to be a, uh, a, re a reject chord. I figured it would be, so I gave my program a, an input or in this case, an output that I want it to give to me uh, as a negative number with relatively low confidence. And so we have chords that have been found in lists where I gave them positive scores, strong positive scores, uh, others that I didn't miss necessarily find so often, getting less significantly positive scores, and we have we have ones that never showed up or sounded absolutely awful that I gave negative actually not scores, but labels. Let's, uh, let me use the correct terminology there. Now, I want to explain to you how exactly I made this model. And what I did was I uh, used linear regression in a peculiar kind of way. So I'm going to refer to a textbook that I used when I taught machine learning at university. Uh, and in light of the fact that I got all of my students to purchase this book, you know, hopefully um, its author, uh, Yasser Abu Mustafa, won't mind me using his slides that he puts up online for everyone to see, which I should link below. Okay, so here's his lecture three, and I'm just going to run quickly through sort of a refresher on, or primer, depending on whether you've seen this before, on linear regression. Okay, so here's his example. Uh, we're going to do credit approval. We would like to have a mathematical model of credit approval. And what we want to know is the amount of credit to give somebody. So we're going to come up with a linear equation that takes some inputs about the person. Age, salary, years in residence, years in job, current debt. And finds a coefficient for each of these such that the credit line that they should have is what is output by the model. Okay, so here's the way the model works. We've got a sum over all input values, and for each one it has a weight. So we have a weighted sum of all the input values. We just add those up. And here we have a matrix representation of the same thing. Now, we have a population. We have a whole bunch of people who have gotten credit before, and maybe we weeded out of them the ones that were inappropriately given too much or too little credit, and we create a training set. Okay, so these are attributes of people that were given credit and how much credit they were given, like what their credit card maximum balance was or something like that. Okay, so what we're going to try to do is replicate whatever the phenomenon is that we're observing here through a linear equation or function. So I'm not going to go through all of the derivation. You can look through this yourself. You can watch Abu Mustafa's lecture. It's really good. Um, but sort of to give you a visual of it, how it works, um, here we've got it inputs. So the, the x's are inputs. And this is in this uh, illustration, they're just the positions along this axis. And then we have 
what we want is an output. So these are desired outputs from members of the training set. In this case, it's kind of a mess, but what we want to do with linear regression is fit a line that has the least error with respect to each sample. So here we've got a fairly significant error, but the way the linear regression works is this is the minimum distance between the predicted output and the training output for this sample that it could be. And here we have a two-dimensional case. So we have a vector uh, with two members in it, x1 and x2. These are positions in some input space. We have y values that are the output value that we want, the, the, the value that we'd like the model to produce. And so here we can fit a plane. So in this case, it would just be some weight times x1 and some weight times x2. We could represent these as matrices. So here we have got an X matrix. This is all of the vector elements for a an individual population member, and their core. And in the Y vector, their corresponding observed credit line that they were given in this example. So let's skip through the derivation and just go to the end. What we end up with is computing a pseudo inverse matrix of X. And then we can multiply that matrix by the y vector, and then we just the weights just pop out. It's a simple one-step learning. Uh, it's very powerful though, because you can do, for example, uh, linear regression with input space transform. Uh, polynomial regression is just linear regression where you have squares and cubes and so forth of elements of your input data. So you could take logs or cosines or any other function. As long as the coefficients are on the outside of any function in any nonlinear function in your formula, you can use linear regression to fit a, a line to your data. OK, so as I mentioned, what we want to do is find these coefficients that, when multiplied by input vector values, will give us in this case, since we want a classifier, we don't care what the output values are exactly. We just wanted them to be positive for consonant chords and negative for excessively dissonant chords. And so we're, what we're going to do is try to find a way to get a line in, in this n-dimensional space, this 11-dimensional space, that puts every chord on the correct positive or negative side of this line that we, will refer, we refer to as a decision surface in machine learning. But here's a problem that I encountered. I can't just take vector representations of these chords and put in like plus one and minus one for each one of them and get a line that gives me the correct decision surface. So in this example here, the first two chords listed have a minor second, which is a relatively dissonant interval, highly dissonant, dissonant interval, but two constant intervals as well, major third and minor third. And so if you have a reasonably high coefficient for consonants for major minor third, then those will those two positive coefficients will outweigh the negative coefficient of the minor second, and you'll get a positive result. And the same is true for the for the second example where we have a minor second, a major third, and a fourth. But then the next one has a problem. The next one has two dissonant intervals. It has a minor second and a tritone. And those aren't necessarily going to be outweighed by the fourth. Or in the case of the fourth one in this list here, uh, the, the fifth, that's fifth interval that's also found in this chord. But these are chords that were found in lists, and I would like them to come out with positive values. right? So at the bottom, what we have is... The, the two intervals that I'm talking about, the tritone and the minor second, that themselves are going to produce negative outputs. And also most chords that have them, these intervals in them, will get negative scores. So how do we get positive scores? Well, if I just plug in minus one and plus one for each of these, it wouldn't work out very well. This slide is, uh, is sort of training data, and this is the predicted values. And what happens is, these chords that have too many distant intervals in them get dragged to the negative side of the line where we don't want them to be. And so I solved this in a way that I haven't actually seen before, but I'm sure somebody who knows machine learning better than I do knows 
what this is called, but the idea here is to tweak the Y values for those chords and make them larger positive values to compensate for the fact that they have these negative intervals. And what will ultimately happen is that the perfect fourth and perfect fifth will get larger coefficients to compensate to the effect that the, a minor second plus a tritone is a negative number, but it isn't, doesn't have as much magnitude as the fourth or a fifth. And so as a result, we end up pulling those chords over to the positive side of the decision surface. I could show you the code to the program that did this, it's, but it's a huge mess. Uh, it was one of these things where I didn't think I'd ever show it to anybody, so it's uh, kind of confusing. It's, it'd be probably do more harm than good to show you uh, exactly how it works. But here's the output. And forgive me for all the excessive digits. I like to do that sometimes as a joke. Um, but here are the coefficients that we get for each of the intervals that you would find in chords. And so you would sum up, you do a weighted sum of each of your intervals, and these are the weights. So we have for minor second, we got about minus 0.3. For major second, we got a minus 0.05. So it's much less dissonant. You see that interval in many more chords. Then we have the third the thirds and the fourth that are fairly high positive. The tritone is not as dissonant. In fact, it's the least dissonant of the dissonant intervals, according to this model, which is derived from lists of chords that people actually play. In fact, there's controversy over whether or not the tritone is really dissonant. A lot of people find it to be dissonant. A lot of people don't, and it's used in a lot of music around the world. So it's actually not really surprising that it wouldn't have a very large negative coefficient. So then we've got some consonant intervals again with large positive values. Surprisingly, the major sixth has the largest one, and that's just because it shows up in a lot of popular chords. And then we have the minor and major sevenths, which again are slightly dissonant according to the results of this model. The next step is to apply this model to finding a scale where the harmonic chords are as bad as they can possibly be. So let's let's go through this sort of pseudocode here and then I'll show you the code for this one because it doesn't look quite so bad. The uh, first thing we want to do is iterate over all possible heptatonic scales. So heptatonic scales are those that have seven notes in intervals, uh, like C major has C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and then it wraps around to the next higher C. And that's an arbitrary choice. It's just common to have heptatonic scales. People use those a lot, but they also use a nine, 10 note scales in, in many examples as well. Uh, now for each of those scales, we're gonna iterate over all the harmonic chords. Now what's a harmonic chord? I don't have a good definition for you, other than what you do is you pick a note in the scale, then you skip a note, and you play the, the, the next note after that, and then you skip a note, and then you play the next note after that. So if we numbered the notes in our scale one through seven. So C would be one, D would be two, and E would be three in a C major scale, okay? Then we're gonna pick one, three, and five. So that'll give C, E, and G. There's our C major chord. And so then what you do is you shift that over and then you start on D. So you have D, F, and A would be a D minor chord in a C major scale. And so there's going to be seven chords of these, seven of these harmonic chords in each scale. And so for this weird scale that, that came out, what, uh, what the code does is it gives a consonance or dissonance score for each of the harmonic chords in the scale, sums those up, and then keeps track of and ultimately reports the worst scale that it came across, the scale with the worst score sum over all harmonic chords. So here's how this works. We have, uh, we, have the, we have the coefficients that I showed before, the function that computes the consonants. So it's gonna iterate over all intervals found in the chord. And for each interval, it's going to look up the weight. Okay, so now if there happens to be two of the same interval, it will come across that interval twice and therefore will add the coefficient twice to this value that it's summing and it'll return that value. 
So it's going to be the sum of each of the different coefficients that were found in this model. Okay. So the next thing that happens is for each scale, I'm going to I'm going to iterate over all of the harmonic chords in the scale. And then here is the code that loops over all scales. So we've got 4,096 theoretically possible scales give in our equally tempered 12-tone system. But I'm only going to consider those that have seven notes in them. So now I run this program, and here's the output. I'm just going to show you the one, the last one that that it picked. So these are the, the tones in the chord. So this is would be a C if we're starting with C. And then 2 is a D and 8 is a G. I'll show you that in a moment. And this is the score. So this is the dissonance or consonant score of the chord. Okay. And so what we're trying to do is find which of all these scales that it is iterated through has the lowest total sum. And this is the one that does. So let's look at that. So this is a uh, digest of the results of the search program that I just showed you. And so here we've got the, the notes in the scale. The first one is, if we're starting with C, would be a C. The second one is a C sharp, or in the scale we'd, we'd call it a D flat. The next one is a D, or what we'd call an E double flat in the scale. Then we have a G, which we would want to call an F double sharp. The, the next is a G sharp, then an A sharp, and finally a B. So below that, we have all of the harmonic chords. So the first, third, and fifth notes in the scale are 0, 2, and 8, which are C, D, and G sharp. And I went and looked up what these chords would be called uh, in a chord namer that I found online. And we'll see just how hor horrible these are. So the first chord is a C suspended 2 chord with a sharp 5. Okay, so the C sus 2 normally would be C, D, and G, but the fifth note of the chord is raised by a half step. Most of the rest of these chords are just have really ugly names if you start on the root of the chord. So I picked the inversions of the chords that were more concise. So the next one is an inversion of a G diminished triad. Then we have a G sharp diminished triad. Then an, uh, an inverted uh, C dominant seven suspended chord. Now in this case, it's a dominant seven chord because the seven in, in the chord is a minor seven. It's a suspended chord. In this case, it's not a sus two or four. It is a fully suspended chord. There is no third or equivalent in the scale. So we've got the root, we have the equivalent of the five, and we have a minor seven. So that would be the uh, C dominant seven suspended. We have uh, C sharp dominant suspended, uh, dominant seven suspended. Then we have an inverted D dominant seven sharp five suspended. So we've got the one, we have a sharp fifth, a minor seven, and no third in the chord. And finally, we have a B sus2 sharp 5. So I went and looked up this chord on Ian Ring's website, where he lists every possible scale and names every one of them that has a name. And this scale that came out is number 3,463. If you go to his site, you can read about what that means. So here we have the web page on Ian Ring's website for this scale. And uh, first thing we can do is uh, play the notes on the scale. So it's not too bad other than this weird leap in, at this point in the scale. Uh, but now, if, for those of you who might uh, cringe at uh, really horrible sounding chords, you might want to turn your volume down and we'll go ahead and play each of the harmonic chords. Yeah, that was pretty bad. So I'm hoping that our our good friend, Mr. 12 Tone, will be so kind as to 
maybe consider using this scale in a composition because he likes seems to like to do that lately. And I'd like to thank everybody for watching and being patient with me uh, making this video. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks.